Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Just the usual announcements from me before we get started. Um, please stay muted during the presentation. When you have questions or comments for our speakers at any time, please add them into the chat with everyone box at the bottom of your screen. I will share them with our speakers at the end of the presentation. And at that time, if you want to turn your camera on and unmute, we can try to do this um, in the virtual world um, a little bit more live. If you prefer, you can ask your question live. Um, you'll be getting an evaluation from our team in the next day or two um, by email, and please make sure to fill that out for us as it helps us with future planning. And finally, the disclosure statement from the Grand Rounds Planning Committee. The Planning Committee for Grand Rounds has no relevant financial relationship to disclose. And with all of that, I will turn things over to Dr. Becky Wiester, who will introduce our guest speakers and our lectureship for today. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. So this is the um, annual child abuse grand rounds, the Holt Webster grand rounds, which was um, kindly uh, donated and funded by the family of Holt Webster. Um, I don't even know how many years ago it goes on um, every year. And so it's an honorary. Uh, it's an honor to have this grand rounds just dedicated to our our um, topic. And today we're welcoming um, Jim Anders and Shannon Carpenter, who are both professors of pediatrics and doctors uh, from Kansas City, Missouri at Children's Mercy Hospitals, as you can see um, on your screen. And Dr. Anders is a well-known, well-published, uh, uh, well-respected uh, child abuse pediatrician who has contributed over the years in many ways to child abuse understanding, treatment, and prevention. And he'll be talking about child abuse issues. And Dr. Shannon Carpenter is also a professor of pediatrics, pediatric hematologist, who, amongst her other research and clinical work that she does, uh, has taken time to be one of our favorite collaborators in um, with the child abuse uh, groups to talk about clotting and the role of hematology in evaluating um, child abuse. So I will speak no more and just welcome them. Thank you for coming, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. Uh, you can see our title, uh, Bleeding and Clotting and Abuse, oh my. For those of you who are too young to know uh, the movie this is from, uh, it's from The Wizard of Oz, which is sort of like Harry Potter, but completely different. Um, and uh, if you've never watched it, you should watch it because then you would understand our title. The other thing uh, Dr. Wister didn't mention is that Dr. Carpenter and I are actually married. We are spouses. We have a family. And we are probably the only child abuse doctor, hematology doctor couple in the world. That's at least what we've surmised. And so that's how we got into this work. Um, I can't even remember, and perhaps when she's doing her part, she can remember. I, I don't remember how this started, um, but we were talking one day and, and this sort of this sort of line of work and research evolved for us. Um, uh, so we're gonna talk about bleeding and clotting and how it applies to child abuse. Uh, we're going to talk about how uh, evaluating bleeding disorders in the, in the context of possible child abuse. To use data to understand if and when and how intracranial thromboses mimic child abuse. And understanding novel hypotheses regarding bleeding, bleeding, clotting, and child abuse. When evaluating children who may be abused or who are seen with unusual bleeding or bruising in, say, a hematology clinic, there's a lot of overlap in these fields. And there's a real uh, mimic the bleeding disorders are a real mimic of child abuse. They can get confused and misdiagnoses can happen. Additionally, there's a lot of novel or unique hypotheses that get put forth in these situations in court and in other settings. And so what we wanna be able to do is be logical and thoughtful and objective uh, in this process. So uh, we'll start with just a case example. Uh, we have a three month old who presents to the emergency department with altered mental status. No external findings and a head CT shows the following. And you can see there's a mixed density subdural hematoma on the right side uh, for certain, probably a little bit on the left side too. And uh, it goes over the convexity um, of the, uh, the brain on the right side. Oh, right here. Somebody gave me permission to annotate. Now I'm trying to move forward and I can't because I'm annotating. I want to stop annotating and move forward. So, whoever select the annotate, uh, select the annotate icon again, I think uh, that will delete it. 
I can't stop the annotate icon. Okay, now we're back. All right, so uh, the child becomes apneic and is intubated and uh, develops elevated intracranial pressure. Uh, later on, an exam has moderate bilateral retinal hemorrhages in multiple layers. The skeletal survey is negative, so is the follow-up two weeks later. There's no other trauma anywhere on the child. And this child has long-term uh, sequela, is eventually discharged with NG feeds, occupational therapy, physical therapy. This child's brain's not okay. So would you test for bleeding disorders? And if so, which ones? Why and why not uh, is the question at, at hand. And, and these are real cases in, in child abuse. We get these in hematology, it's, it's consulted. And so what this Grand Rounds is about is this thought process and, and trying to make it objective and based on data and science. Uh, there's a lot of different stuff that's published that we can look at uh, when considering these questions. There's a lot of one-offs, case series, Delta case case uh, presentations, single cases, Delta storage pool disease as a mim mimic of child abuse, um, intracranial hemorrhage in, in von Willebrand disease, a report on six cases, intraparenchymal hemorrhage in a patient with osteogenesis imperfecta and plasminogen activator inhibitor one deficiency, a novel association between chronic subdural hematoma and fibrolytic pathway defect case report. Lots of different stuff on this that you can look at, and you have to be careful with it because, you know, whenever looking at you're looking at case reports, we have to remember that case reports and case series are there to generate hypotheses. They're not there to dictate our science. Um, and when you look at all of these, if you look at any grading system for, for literature, they're always very, very low. And so we want to be careful when we're thinking of what tests to run that single case reports don't dictate what we do because they're single case reports. As, as Dr. Carpenter will, will say, it's sort of like uh, what I saw in my trip to the zoo, uh, and those shouldn't dictate our science. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Shannon and let her uh, take it for, for the next period. So um, I think uh, a couple of things as we go into this, how do we know that bleeding disorders mimic abusive head trauma? And one of the ways we thought about looking at this was looking at, well, what is the prevalence of intracranial hemorrhage in different bleeding disorders? And registries are the way we have very much um, started to look at, um, I've tried to look at um, bleeding disorders because as rare disorders, um, it's really important for us to look at them that way. Um, and because um, we can't really do lots of randomized controlled trials. Now, rare disorders, um, bleeding disorders don't have equivalent prevalence across all of the different um, communities. Um, but um, all the different diagnoses. So we'll talk a little bit about those different prevalences as we go forward. Um, you can go forward a, a slide, please, Jim. Um, so uh, I, I also want to remember how we, we thought of this. We had seen um, two children in the same day. We had, were sitting on our couch um, and talking about the day, as you do, and we had realized we had seen two six-month-olds, and they had presented almost identically with bruising, but we had done completely different workups on them. And a priori, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and it really has to do with our specialties and how we um, come to things. And um, I think there's a there's a, a lot of fallacies we can fall into as physicians in terms of how we think. Um, and this is one of them, where we focus on the things we know, as opposed to thinking about the broad presentation of the patient and what things might be causing this. So um, when thinking about this, when you look at registry data, particularly if it's a, a prospective registry, the, the the rating of the data becomes much higher. Um, and so if you have a prospective registry, this one looked at intracranial hemorrhage in hemophilia A and B. Now hemophilia A and B are what we call our more common bleeding disorders, but to give you an idea of the prevalence of those, um, the prevalence of hemophilia A is one in 5,000 live male births and hemophilia B is about one in every 20,000. Um, so you can imagine that you know child abuse is far more prevalent. And then the other caveat is that having a bleeding disorder does not actually protect you from being abused. Um, and in fact, having a chronic disease, it may increase your risk. Um, so even if we find uh, abuse, uh, even if we find, excuse me, a bleeding disorder in, in some of these cases, um, we find that, you know, they, they may have other evidence of abuse. So in this particular study, um, you can go forward to on these, um, we looked at, um, this, this group looked at ICH um, in, uh, and they looked at a, a variety of different registries, which um, had been following patients. You can see the distribution of, 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 age, of different dates when these were published. Um, you can see there 
uh, the uh, N of uh, the study and then the N of ICH. And the frequency of ICH ranged from uh, as low as 2 or 3 percent up to almost uh, up to 15 percent in this particular registry. Um, and this is looking at hemophilia A and B. And of course, uh, hemophilia A and B have different severities. So uh, within this, there may be different severities that are, are driving the risk of, um, of intracranial hemorrhage. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, go forward, please. Uh, one more. Yeah. So, and then we thought about, well, we're looking at, in hemophilia. We look, oh, back one, please. We look at the, the, um, the, uh, the overall um, kind of age and, and range of ages, because that's what's important to us as we're caring for bleeding disorder patients. But when you're talking about you know, abusive head trauma, you're really looking at the age at the time of ICH. So this study really kind of narrowed it down to where were we seeing intracranial hemorrhage. And you can see that it, it distributes across all of the ages of hemophilia, which you would expect, um, but primarily around um, the, uh, the, the first year of life. And indeed, uh, even when you break that down further, you can see that it is about uh, in that first month or two months of age is more common in, in hemophilia as well. And we do know that birth trauma can lead to intracranial hemorrhage in patients with hemophilia. Next slide. So another study uh, looked at um, babies before two years of age. And this, the Universal Data Collection Project is a project of the Centers for Disease Control um, and uh, Prevention, which uh, enrolls patients at federally funded hemophilia treatment centers. And since 1998, um, we have anywhere between 135 and 140 HTCs. You have one at Seattle, we have one at Kansas City, and uh, we enroll patients on these studies regularly. And so our enrollment for children zero to two years of age began in 2003 and was published in 2016. So you can go forward. And this is just the, the heading for that particular study. One more. So in this study, uh, 547 male babies with hemophilia A and B and 324 with severe hemophilia were enrolled. One more. And you can see here that the intracranial hemorrhage was um, not the most common thing that we saw, um, but that there were a good number of patients with who had that, about 8% of babies, and the number of episodes you can see for bleeding um, on the second column. Uh, and so to break that down a little bit further with the next slide, Next slide. Uh, you can see that uh, the prevalence by year and visits, uh, you can see the overall was about 4%. And some babies, interestingly, have more than one episode of ICH, so you have to consider that as well um, for a number of reasons. Next slide. And in, it's important to note that in this number of ICH, about almost 80% had severe disease. So we do anticipate more spontaneous bleeding in patients with severe disease. And it's important to note that that's also easier to diagnose because they're going to have an abnormal PTT and their factor level is going to be below 5% in that population. Next slide. So then it becomes the question of, well, what were we know related to delivery versus what we would call spontaneous um, versus known traumatic? Um, and you can see that that was broken down in this study as well, which was very helpful. And about 40% or 18 of the uh, of the instances were um, sp considered spontaneous. Um, and this was, of course, reported by the people who were entering the data. So uh, that's important to note in a registry that you're always um, dealing with however people interpret um, their entry of the data. And that about half of those were subdural, which I think becomes more important for um, our abusive head trauma question. Um, you can see that that was distributed across a variety, all the different areas of the brain um, with intracerebral being um, the next most common. Next slide. And this um, calculates to about a 1.9% annual rate of that. Next slide. So I've mentioned, so we call um, rare bleeding disorders rarer than hemophilia, right? So I've already pointed out that hemophilia is very rare. Rare bleeding disorders range from about one in every 500,000 individuals to one in every three to five million individuals. So when we're considering working up patients for these, we have to consider the population prevalence as well. Um, and, this, and a lot of our studies in this, of course, have to be either cross-sectional or retrospective because there's only so many patients who have this. So prospective um, registries take forever to um, en enroll, as you can imagine, with rare bleeding disorders. So this study um, was a retrospective study looking at 457 patients with um, congenital factor deficiencies, which would, which would typically um, 
may include hemophilia. In this case, it does, but a lot of times we'll just include rare bleeding disorders. Um, and they looked at 57 episodes of ICH. And you can see the, the wide range of, of dates that were involved here and the wide range of diagnoses. The median age was eight years um, and ranged, um, as you can see, without broad range. Um, but they found that about 80% were below 15 years of age. So this is really a pediatric problem. And they had 10 of those um, instances out of 57 that were less than one year of age. But two thirds were trauma associated and known trauma associated. Um, and the ICH was the primary bleeding episode in about 20% of patients. Next slide. In another registry, the North American Rare Bleeding Disorder Registry, this was really a kind of a cross-sectional retrospective study. So they asked one time um, all the HTCs to look back at their data on rare bleeding disorders, and they collected the data in that time period from 225 HTCs. Um, and so um, when uh, the North American includes um, our, our Canadian partners, which is why it's a higher number. Um, and so the disease prevalence, age, family, history, all these things were included in this, um, in this study. Next slide. So you can see the diagnoses here. They did not include hemophilia in this particular study. Um, so the factor deficiencies, 2, 7, 10, 5, and 13, and then our fibrinogen, um, homozygous fibrinogen deficiency is going to be afibrinogenemia, um, which is really um, an absolute absence of the important clotting factor that makes your makes your clots. Heterozygous is going to be hypofibrinogenemic. Um, and so uh, it's important because that is um, afibrinogenemia is a very severe bleeding disorder. Um, and you can see that the rate of ICH in that is much higher. Um, and you can also see that um, factor 10 and factor 13 have fairly high rates um, of intracranial hemorrhage as well. Now, the rate of these disorders is on the order of one to one to five million, just to keep that into consideration. So to get more information about these, next slide. We have to look at populations that have a higher prevalence. Um, and the Iranian um, studies have been the most fantastic on factor 13 deficiency. They have a very high prevalence of factor 13 deficiency in Iran, and they've done a wonderful job of tracking the, um, the disorder within their population. Um, and they have really looked at um, CNS bleeding very carefully in this, in this group. Um, and about 92% of the patients who have um, bleeding with factor 13 deficiency have intraparenchymal bleeds. Um, and we, we say that it's the rate is about a third of patients with factor 13 deficiency. Now, factor 13 deficiency isn't screened for by your PT and PTT. Um, it has to be done specifically uh, to test for that. Um, and so it can be missed if you're not looking for it carefully. Um, but, there, but the patients have significant bleeding, and all of them should go on prophylaxis as soon as they're diagnosed because of the high rate of intracranial hemorrhage. Um, but you can see that only about 3% had um, subdural hemorrhage, or one per 50 million, if you start doing your math uh, as we break down, um, as we've done in our, in our efforts to try to understand what to look for as we're looking for things in patients. Next slide. So what about von Willebrand disease? So von Willebrand disease is a conundrum, not just for uh, child abuse physicians, but for hematologists as well. Um, there are many different types of von Willebrand disease, but the most common occurs in um, about 1% of the population and about, uh, you know, maybe, uh, and then about 0.1% maybe present with um, symptoms. So is this a mimic of, of, of abuse? And uh, next slide. So you will find those who will argue that it is. And this is a, a slide from uh, a, a website that um, makes the argument that von Willebrand disease, among many other things, uh, could present with findings similar or equivalent to abuse. Next slide. And there have been um, successful arguments that von Willebrand disease uh, has led to findings that are um, consistent with abuse. And uh, in this case, this was very well published from Boston, uh, where a nanny was initially convicted of, of a murder in a child um, who had just turned one, uh, who had intracranial hemorrhage, among other injuries. Um, but then that trial was reversed um, after uh, the DA reversed their decision and could not rule, said they said they could not rule the death a homicide. Next slide. So just to go back on how we actually diagnose von Willebrand disease. Um, so we look at a number of different aspects of this. Um, von Willebrand antigen is looking just at how much of the protein is present. 
Von Willebrand activity looks at how well it works or the function of the protein. And there's a numerous different activity assays that can be done. And then we look at factor eight because factor eight is um, tied to Von Willebrand in circulation. And Von Willebrand factor protects factor eight from um, degradation. And so if you don't have enough von Willebrand factor, your factor eight half-life will be shorter. Uh, and so with severe deficiency of von Willebrand factor, the factor eight level is usually low as well. We can also look at multimers of the fa uh, von Willebrand factor to kind of see how it's put together. Um, and that helps us determine the subtype of von Willebrand disease in patients who have that. Next slide. So we recently in the last year, um, we um, categorized our diagnostic criteria. And it was a big undertaking from a number of different national and international um, groups. Um, and I'm going to walk through this um, slide just for a little bit because I think it's really important to understand how complicated the diagnosis of particularly mild von Willebrand disease is. So you can see here that we start, the part I cut out here is that we start with someone who's bleeding and that's really important or presents with, with some sort of finding. Um, and you can see that um, when we look at um, factor eight uh, and von Willebrand factor on the right there, uh, you can see that if the von, factor eight is much lower than the von Willebrand factor, we really want to look for, is there something going on with the binding of von Willebrand factor to factor eight, or is there a factor eight deficiency? If you have von Willebrand factor levels greater than 50, then that person does not have, this is below the, this is above the lower limit of normal, uh, that we can rule out von Willebrand disease. Now, there's a couple of caveats to that, which I'll allude to later, but that's, we'll start with that. And then we have, if you have levels less than 30, kind of over, kind of in the mid-right, then those patients probably have von Willebrand disease of some sort, and we need to do further testing on them. But then we land in this 30 to 50 range. And this is where things get really interesting, because if there's no bleeding, then we say, well, they probably don't have von Willebrand disease. So that might be the patient who we see preoperatively, who has been evaluated by ENT, they need a tonsillectomy, um, they've not had any bleeding, and they've gotten these levels, and we get this kind of 45% range, and we say, well, eh, you're probably all right, no family history of bleeding, so on and so forth. Um, or if they have bleeding, they've had lots of nosebleeds, um, it's a young girl, she's presenting with heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, then we're going to go on and do further testing, and we're going to look to see if they have um, a type of von Willebrand disease. Now, briefly on the types of von Willebrand disease, we have our quantitative ones, which are type one and three, where we just have not enough. Now, type one is a variable level of not enough, and type three is zero. We don't have any. And then we have our type twos, um, which there is some sort of qualitative deficiency, and that um, leads to those multimer levels and some other uh, specific testing, including genetic testing that we do. Genetic testing for type one is not recommended because um, we know that it is not consistent and finding a genetic uh, mutation that may lead to type one uh, is very unusual actually and certainly becomes more unusual as the von Willebrand factor level is higher. So next slide. You guys weren't expecting a full-on hematology conversation were you? Um, so um, but the challenges in identifying von Willebrand disease, as I alluded to, are, are, are myriad. So von Willebrand factor um, is related to the glycosylation, the level, the baseline levels. And so if you have type O blood, um, you have kind of a little lower normal range. We don't apply it very much in our general hematology approach to this because we really apply more of the bleeding versus no bleeding, but we'll discuss that a little bit more as well. And then type AB has the highest normal range. So if you, if you look at the bell curve, of type O, it's going to be shifted to the left of the bell curve of AB for von Willebrand disease, a von Willebrand factor, excuse me. Additionally, von Willebrand factor and factor eight are acute phase reactants. So if you find someone who's say had some trauma or had, um, you know, is currently anemic, you are gonna have a baseline higher von Willebrand factor level, and that will create complications in your diagnostic process. Next slide. So let's go back to our case reports of spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage in patients with von Willebrand um, disease. So you can see here that in this case, um, all of these were intracerebral, and this is these are adults with um, a spontaneous ICH. Um, and there's four cases. And um, next slide. Um, and so you can look, there's been a couple of other papers on this as well with intracranial hemorrhage. Now I wanna draw your attention here. These are more pediatric, which is why I kind of went on to this one. Um, but I also wanna point out that with the exception of two, um, case number two and case number six, 
Um, the other patients have very severe von Willebrand disease, what we would consider severe von Willebrand disease. Secondly, you can see that there was trauma associated with all of these cases. And what's interesting is that most of our bleeding disorder patients, if we can treat the intracranial hemorrhage quickly, recover with very few sequelae. Um, and so uh, in this case, there was sequelae from one patient who developed hemiplegia. Um, but the rest of the patients um, recovered without any problems, and no, there were no deaths within the group. Next slide. Um, and here's an example of uh, a case report of subdural hematoma and retinal hemorrhage in a child um, who may or may not have von Willebrand disease. Um, and this child had a, a known trauma, fell from a chair, um, but had numerous retinal hemorrhages in all layers. And there's very little data supporting von Willebrand disease causing retinal hemorrhages in a, in a longitudinal way, um, though we haven't, to be honest, looked um, in all of our patients with von Willebrand disease who are in the registries. Next slide. But in this particular case, the laboratory values, um, as you can see here, are in that kind of gray range. And so when we're applying this, if we're using our diagnostic criteria from the publication last summer, um, we, we apply it based upon whether there's bleeding or not. However, if you're considering, considering that someone might be abused, the bleeding question becomes much more difficult to, to tease out and whether or not we should consider that in, in terms of whether the patient has von Willebrand disease or not. Certainly, if we could get a history of, of other kinds of bleeding, but then, you know, how much is appropriate um, or how much is, uh, can we weigh that in terms of making that diagnosis? And in that case, is it reasonable to say that the amount of bleeding or the severity of bleeding is consistent with the levels that we're seeing, even if the patient does have von Willebrand disease? Because as I mentioned before, having a bleeding disorder does not protect you um, from having abuse as well. Next slide. So here's just some other um, reports. And again, just ke keeping a track of the fact that these are case series. And so people did find inter interretinal hemorrhages in these patients and, and retinal hemorrhages, but and they found that they might have von Willebrand disease. But are these true, true unrelated? Um, or are this um, because we know von Willebrand disease is, is somewhat prevalent? Or is it really that there's a causative relationship between these? Next slide. I will pass it on over to Dr. Anders at this time. Okay, so when we started talking about um, this subject, th there were no formal recommendations from any real entity or body on what tests you should do uh, when children come in and there's a concern for abuse and you're worried that they could also have a bleeding disorder or you wanna rule those out. Uh, a lot of folks would do the basic screening test of a PT, a PTT, and a CBC. What if there are other findings? What if there's pattern bruises? What if there are fractures? What if the child discloses abuse? And these are all things we have to consider because not every case of possible abuse is the same, and they're all mitigating factors. You know, if you have a, ch a child with 14 rib fractures and intracranial hemorrhage, the bleeding disorder didn't cause the rib fractures. So, so we can think about that a little bit differently than a child who has only subdural hemorrhage. When we started working on this, uh, Shannon and I were working on uh, reports for the American Academy of Pediatrics, and we had a group from the Child Abuse uh, uh, COCAN group and, and SOHO, the, the hematology group in the AAP, talking to one another. And it was fascinating to, to talk to them. When we would talk to the child abuse group, they, they basically wanted the report to rule out all bleeding disorders in any patient with a subdural. And, and I emphasize the word all. And then the hematologists would say they can't actually rule out all bleeding disorders and, and they would frequently say, why do you want me to rule out bleeding disorders? This child was clearly abused. Now, keep in mind, the hematologists frequently were not the ones going to court and having to defend their diagnostics the way the child abuse doctors were. And so there was this tension um, between the two groups that we, we kind of saw coming, but was interesting to navigate. The perfect study when thinking about bleeding disorders is to have a large population of children with known uh, intracranial hemorrhage or subdural hemorrhage and a verifiable trauma history and then a panel of all known tests for bleeding disorders drawn on each child. And then the tests repeated as necessary and consistent testing regardless of clinical status. This is not going to happen for a multitude of reasons. There's ethical reasons, there's funding reasons, but we're never gonna get the perfect test looking at bleeding disorders and child abuse. And so we have to look at what we have and, and use what we can. And a few years ago, Shannon and I wrote these clinical and technical reports for the AAP on evaluating uh, for bleeding disorders in, in cases of possible child abuse. We're, we're updating these, and that should be out later on this year, hopefully. And we'll touch on some of the things that, that you'll see in the updates. 
So when considering this, and this came out of our discussions, uh, <laughs> frankly, at home about cases, trying to figure out how to process these, this information, you, you can see on the left-hand column, there's a bunch of different bleeding disorders listed. And then there's studies for all of them on the prevalence of the condition. And when putting this table together, we use the upper limits of the prevalence because we were trying to construct something that um, weighted things uh, towards having a bleeding disorder. Uh, when we're looking for, for in cases of child abuse and you're evaluating for other medical conditions, you sort of want to weight against your diagnosis of child abuse and see what you get. And then in each of these conditions, we knew the prevalence of intracranial hemorrhage. And again, we use the upper limits for that. And for many of these conditions, you can calculate a probability of finding a child, a bleeding disorder, finding a specific bleeding disorder in a child with an intracranial hemorrhage. And that is on the pretest probability on the far right column. It's a simple math calculation. The best way to think about this is if you look at factor 13 deficiency, the prevalence of condition upper limits is one in 2 million. Most people would go with one in 6 million, but there were some studies suggesting one in 2 million. And the prevalence of ICH was one third. And so the pretest probability is, is simply one in 6 million. It's, it's a math calculation multiplying one times the other. And you can figure out how likely it is that this bleeding disorder would cause an intracranial hemorrhage. And you can see some of these things are incredibly rare. Um, factor 13 deficiency causing an intracranial hemorrhage would be incredibly rare, not because ICH is rare in factor 13 deficiency, it's actually quite common, but because factor 13 deficiency itself is incredibly rare. And so the odds of, of a kid coming in to the ICU with a subdural hemorrhage due to factor 13 deficiency is really, really low simply because factor 13 deficiency is so rare. And this is true of many other things like combined factors five and eight deficiency, one in 50 million. You can look at the math at some of these and these are incredibly rare uh, situations. And we're gonna come back to this uh, graph uh, information a little bit later on. So when we put together the AAP report, thinking about ICH, it, it, it includes both ICH and bruising separately, but, but this lecture is really about ICH. Uh, it evaluates the recommended testing panel, which I'll cover in a second, evaluates for conditions with a probability of causing ICH in the general population of greater than one in five million. Now, all of those words were picked very carefully. Uh, and, and so the, the greater than can be a little confusing. That means everything you're testing for would have a probability of one in four million or one in three million or one in two million. And it would not test for things that are one in seven million or one in six million. And then it also includes uh, guidance on who to test. Uh, you know, if there's independently witnessed trauma, abusive or otherwise, we probably don't need to rule out bleeding disorders. Other medical findings consistent with abuse like multiple fractures or uh, pattern belt marks or these sorts of things or disclosure of abuse. We don't really need to test for bleeding disorders because there's so much other information that can weigh towards abuse as the diagnosis that it's sort of silly to run a bunch of tests uh, on a child. And we do this in all of medicine, right? Uh, when you have somebody who comes in with, with chest pain and it's, it's so clear, there are so many things pointing towards a heart attack, you, you don't work them up for, for pulmonary embolus and so forth. And so you could do this with anything in medicine. When, when the weight is so strong, we don't need to rule, rule out every condition in every situation. And so the, the recommended testing for ICH in the initial clinical report was a, a PT, a P, a PTT, specific levels of factor eight and factor nine, and that is specifically to test for mild hemophilia. Uh, at CBC with platelets, really the platelets are there to look for uh, anything causing thrombo, thromb, uh, low platelets, uh, and then a D-dimer and a fibrinogen. And uh, those were put in through, whenever you're working through this process with AAP and multiple people, um, there's a negotiation for certain things. And really this came in because of concerns of DIC. And the notion of DIC due to something else causing the intracranial hemorrhage. And we'll get back to that later on. It's a, it's a legitimate concern, um, but not every child who has a subdural hemorrhage is in the ICU intubated and gravely ill. A lot of them come in with big heads and subdurals, and nobody knows how the subdural got there, and the kid's like, you know, otherwise normal. And, and so we made some changes on this in the, in the pending clinical report. So what did we do after we published the initial uh, uh, clinical reports and technical reports? We did some more research to try to get more robust data and, and make our decisions 
a little bit clearer. And Shannon had mentioned some studies using the universal data collection uh, system of the CDC. And it, it includes patient level information on ICH and congenital bleeding disorders. And as she mentioned, that it's distributed across the US and the vast majority of patients with hemophilia receive care at HTCs. And a lot of patients with other bleeding disorders also are seen at HTCs. It's nice because it's a single data set. We can do apples to apples when comparing bleeding disorders. It has a lot of young children in it and specifics of ICH on subjects enrolled before age two. And also factors associated with ICH like trauma or spontaneous. And it gives us the capacity to be a little bit more precise on how we think about this. When you look at the, the subjects in the UDC database and, and the years up there are 98 to 2011 because that was the period of collection in which this occurred. You can see there's a total of uh, 33, just over or nearly 3,800 subjects, the vast majority of which have hemophilia A or hemophilia B. And the mean age of diagnosis of all the subjects was five and a half months. So this is by and large a very young population. However, like I said, it allows us to get a little bit more precise in what we're doing. If you look at von Willebrand disease, there's nearly 500 subjects in the UDC database with von Willebrand disease, but they are an older population because von Willebrand typically presents a little bit later, it's less severe. And, and when we think about child abuse and abusive head trauma and, and looking at epidemiology and mimics, this becomes important because of course, if you look at child abuse and, and abusive head trauma, yes, under the age of two is the population we care about the most, but it's typically a condition of younger kids under a year of age, often six months of age. And when you have von Willebrand, it presents significantly later than if you look at hemophilia A and B, which present just about the same time child abuse, abusive head trauma presents. And then there's other uh, conditions in this database. And the reason there's so few subjects is because these conditions are so rare. And again, when thinking about evaluating for bleeding disorders, in cases of possible child abuse, we have to think about epidemiology and frequency of condition. And you're dealing with things that are really, really rare, and so they're hard to study. Conversely, it's really unusual for these to be a true mimic of child abuse because they're really, really rare. In the entire data set, just under 7% of all subjects had any intracranial hemorrhage. 5.5% of the to total data set had non-traumatic ICH. This is not a typo. Most of the kids who had ICH with congenital bleeding disorders had non-traumatic ICH. Just over 1% had traumatic ICH. This is probably because a lot of these young kids don't have a lot of trauma. When you look at the baby visit data, which is the data specific to kids under the age of two, what I just showed was the entire data set. So four, five, six year olds are in it. This is kids under the age of two. Again, just under 7% had any ICH, but in this data set, we have the location of the ICH and whether there was trauma or no trauma. So this is an improvement on the data we had in years past. So 1% had traumatic subdural, eight of those had hemophilia A, two hemophilia B, and two von Willebrand. And just over 1% had spontaneous subdural hemorrhage, 12 had hemophilia A or B, and one had von Willebrand. The nice thing about this data set is we could go get these individual patients and look and see what was going on. We're looking for true mimics with this. So in hemophilia, only 1% of all subjects had spontaneous SDH, all had severe hemophilia. Important about that is you can detect severe hemophilia with just a PTT. You don't have to get specific factor levels, and that can affect the way we think about this and test in cases of possible abuse. So the probability of spontaneous subdural hematoma in the general population for hemophilia A is one in 500,000, for hemophilia B is one in 2.2 million. So these would be really rare things, but you can see hemophilia A, you kind of want to rule that one out. And, and B is 2.2 million. Remember our initial testing panel uh, that we recommended looked at things that were more common than one in 5 million. So hemophilia B would still meet that threshold. And this is new data after those initial recommendations were, were uh, put forth. Looking at the young uh, babies again, and, and you get into these small numbers because it's really rare, uh, but, but in child abuse, we have to think about rare things. We can see the number of subjects with subdural associated with trauma and the different uh, types of bleeding disorders, and the number with uh, subdural and spontaneous, uh, spontaneous subdural and the various bleeding disorders. You can see the, the, the numbers that I quoted before, 1% of subjects in 
under the age of two had a trauma associated subdural and 1% had spontaneous associated subdural. And you can see the individual counts I mentioned before, hemophilia A and B dominate, but there's a couple of von Willebrand's trickling in and we'll get to that in a second too. There was one subject with spontaneous subdural and von Willebrand. So this is kind of when you're thinking about, do I test for von Willebrand? And you get the kid who comes in, they have a subdural hemorrhage, they're sick, they're intubated, there's nothing else on them. And you're thinking, okay, what bleeding disorders do I have to worry about? And you're going to get your PT and your PTT and look at these things. Do I have to think about von Willebrand? And, and remember, von Willebrand is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. And so this particular subject, when we were able to get the data from the reporting center, was a four-month-old with body stiffening. A head CT uh, showed left layered subdural. The von Willebrand factor was low. The ristocetin cofactor activities were also low. Multimers were normal. So this would meet diagnostic criteria if you are considering the subdural as the bleeding that is needed to sort of get you in the pot for von Willebrand. And this is our one subject on that, that, that chart with uh, type one von Willebrand. Um, and then there's one subject with spontaneous, I'm sorry, this is our one sub subject with spontaneous uh, subdural, and there's also one with trauma. But this is uh, the CT from that child. And there's a couple of important things on this CT. It is not possible to accurately date blood on CT or MRI, but if you use any data, data uh, dating schemes, this is not gonna fall into your acute generally. You can see there's layering of the subdural on the left side as well, where you have bright and dark layered on top of each other. There were no retinal hemorrhages. The skeletal survey was normal. There was no long-term sequela of abuse at the reporting center, um, which was not Kansas City. Shannon and I didn't know this patient. Um, there was no diagnosis of abuse made and CPS did not substantiate the report. So essentially the reporting center attributed the subdurals to von Willebrands in this four month old. If uh, I know our, our child abuse colleagues in, in uh, Seattle are very familiar with this. There's also the question of birth subdural, which uh, the data would not support lasting up until four months of age. However, there's the theoretical possibility that could occur simply because the N of uh, studies looking at birth related subdural isn't that great. It's several hundred, uh, it's not m many, many thousands. And so one has to say, okay, is that possible? Uh, we really, when we look at that, look at, you know, was there a traumatic birth? We follow the, the, the head circumferences over time. Unfortunately, we don't have that from this patient and didn't have access to it due to study procedures. So this particular study that we looked at, looking at the, the, uh, the new data um, from uh, the, the young children uh, from this uh, set of patients, in congenital bleeding disorders, non-traumatic ICH and spontaneous SDH occur most commonly in severe hemophilia A and B. And you can test for those simply with a PTT. You don't need specific factor levels. We didn't find anything to support that von Willebrand is supportive of a mimic of AHT. There's that one case there's that, that uh, caused a subdural. We think if you look carefully at the, the, the case and carefully at the findings, there's not a whole lot to substantiate abuse other than a subdural and you got a kid with von Willebrand. So the implications for testing, specific levels of factor eight and nine are likely not needed uh, in kids with no history of trauma. The data argues against adding von Willebrand to the testing strategy and we may allow, and, and this may allow for targeted testing based on history of trauma because remember now we have different uh, potentials for subdurals based on the presence or absence of trauma. And so this is something you are likely to see in, in the coming months regarding recommendations for testing uh, in cases of possible child abuse. I realize that the, the typing is a little small, but I can't make it any better, bigger, so I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it a little bit. Um, and so there's a lot of yes, no, and arrows, and it's very clear on what the recommendations are. Um, witness trauma, abusive or otherwise, uh, or other findings consistent with abuse, like broken bones, like burns, other things like that, a, a liver laceration. A bleeding disorder evaluation is not needed because bleeding disorders don't explain these other findings. The initial testing panel of, uh, is pretty basic, a PT, a PTT, and a complete blood count with platelets. Now, looking at working down this pathway, there's a couple of things here. History of trauma or potential trauma. Now, as a child abuse doctor, uh, I always know that there might not be a history of tra trauma initially, 
but there might be one offered later. So I'm probably going to go down this one no matter what, simply because stories change um, and new information can come out years later uh, that, that ends up in court. And so I'm generally going to go down this path anyways and get factor eight or nine. If there's no history of trauma or potential trauma, there's no further testing needed. And the reason is because mild hemophilia is not supported as a cause of spontaneous subdurals in young children. If there's neurologic compromise, then a D-dimer and a fibrinogen are recommended because kids with DIC usually are really sick. And usually you're not going to have a well-looking child with no neurologic compromise with DIC. And, and so that, that was added for kids uh, in the ICU who are sick. And again, the, the notion or theory is that if you have DIC and you're bleeding because you have DIC, you can bleed anywhere, including the subdural space. And sometimes the cause of DIC isn't trauma, it can be something else. And so we have to think about that in our differential diagnosis. If any of those are abnormal, any of the tests that were recommended, and the answer is no, the recommendation is to stop. If they are uh, abnormal at all, consult a pediatric hematologist to figure out what to do with it. Now, in the wording of the reports, all of it says, look, if you want to do something different or you're concerned, you should always consult a hematologist and ask for your help. This is not the sort of thing that you should do by cookbook the same all the time. And, and it is highly um, recommended to think about this carefully and, and talk with your hematologist in coming up with a careful strategy. What we wanted to be able to do is put something together that can support people's diagnostic process and make it defensible based on data. So for this part of our talk, there's just about 10, 12 slides after it on clotting. Some bleeding disorders are a real mimic of AHT. We have to think about those. We'll never be able to rule out a bleeding disorder for every single bleeding disorder possible. And bleeding disorder evaluation should be pursued simultaneously with the abuse evaluation in, is in uh, isolated suspected AHT. Okay, our last part is CSVT a mimic of AHT. And I have a uh, little uh, brain explosion um, uh, emoji. I'll explain why in a minute. So here's the case two, a 10 month old seen for vomiting. He may have fallen off his bed two days ago. Right parietal soft tissue swelling on exam. MRI shows bilateral convexity subdural, and there's a right transverse and sigmoid sinus venous thrombosis. So he's got subdurals and thromboses. And he's got adjacent ischemia and edema of the right occipital lobe. So you got a history of minor trauma, you got a subdural, you got some clots. And this is a picture of the subdurals, the soft tissue swelling you can see in this child on MRI. And then uh, I had a radiologist point out where the clots were because I'm not gonna be able to find them on MRV. And that's, of course, the big green arrow. And then you can see the ischemia that is associated with, with the clot in the brain. And so what's the relationship between sinus venous thrombosis and, and SDH causative? Why or why not? The, the basis of this theory is it's often offered in, in court that there is a thrombosis in the head and it essentially caused the brain to explode. That, that is the fundamental. When you get down to it, there's a, an increase in the, the theory is that there's a clot in the brain and there's back pressure. In, in the sinuses, and it causes all the vessels to explode and cause subdurals all over the place. And this is listed in um, some, some writings by some folks who, who are, are, are known uh, to uh, generate some interesting hypotheses regarding non-accidental injuries. This one lists uh, such famous ones as dysphagic choking, um, CPR, uh, venous thrombosis is in there as well. This is a, a case report. Uh, from another uh, person who, who is known to offer some interesting theories. This is the entirety of the case report. Um, if we had more time, I would read you the entirety of the case report. But this is a kid with retinal hemorrhages and a clot in the brain. And I always find this interesting. I wonder if the editors made the author change the specific wording that at the end, the last line, this case confirms this association is the key word there uh, between retinal hemorrhages and clots in the brain. And of course, we all know that association and causation are two different things, but uh, we often get to explain that uh, in, in testimony, how association and causation are two different things. So other studies looking at clots in the brain and subdurals, uh, this was probably the best uh, known one. Uh, up in, and it's a few years old. It's a single center in Utah. They looked at 36 children with intracranial venous thrombosis, and none of them had subdurals present. And the conclusion of the study is that there's no relationship between uh, CSVT and subdurals. Uh, there's another one looking at 
retinal hemorrhages in kids with CSVT. They looked at 29 children. Again, this is a rare condition, so the median age was nine. All had newly diagnosed CSVT. Five had retinal hemorrhages. The vast majority of those would not be confused with those we've seen abuse. They are pretty minor ones next to a swollen optic disc. The fifth patient had meningitis and sepsis and all sorts of bad stuff going on in the brain. And the RH were moderate in number, posterior pole and intraretinal. Again, not the ones that we would say much more characteristic of abuse. So in other discussions on our couch, I discovered from, um, from Shannon that there's actually a registry of uh, patients with CSVT. And I said, boy, that might be useful. If we looked at that, we could learn more about CSVT and subdurals. And uh, we looked at that particular registry to characterize the frequency of subdurals in CSVT and identify clinical and historical factors associated with CSVT and SDH and see if there's any mimics of AHT. We defined a priori uh, that uh, there are certain things that are not mimics of abuse. For instance, if a child had a brain operation and had some sort of resection and they got a clot and a subdural after that, that's really not a mimic. If somebody got hit by a car, that's not a mimic. If somebody has uh, this discovered in the hospital on day two of life, that's not a mimic of abuse, so forth. And IVH and EDH, not mimics. Kids who are older than two, not really mimics because that's not the population we're talking about. Uh, you can see there are 1,500 subjects that, that uh, were in the entire database. And these are subjects with strokes of all kind. A lot of them are arterial. We had 216 with CSVT. And if you follow the arrows down, only 20 had subdural hemorrhages. So we have 20 subjects with subdurals and CSVT. So 14% of the entire database had CSVT and 9% had CSVT and subdurals, 9% of that 14%. When we looked at those that had SDH and CSVT to those that did not have SDH but did have CSVT, we found those with CSVT and SDH were younger and basically sicker. And this is in general looking at the total population. And that makes sense. Kids with clots in their brain are sicker than kids without clots in their brain. When we look at the 20 kids with CSVT and SDH, 19 of them were clearly not mimicking child abuse. Five of them had medical procedures, and, and I'm not talking about like an IV put in. They had brain surgeries, and they would clearly not be mimicking child abuse. Eight of them had medical conditions, and so they might have vasculitis, something else that was clearly identifiable in their history that wouldn't be confused with abuse. Five had complications of trauma, some of these were known accidental trauma, like one I think fell off a tractor. Two of them had uh, uh, were abused, but they had other findings of abuse, like fractures and other significant injuries. I think one have a, had a liver laceration. Five were birth-related. Three were greater than the age of two. And four had bleeds that were not uh, subdurals. And you can see that adds up to more than 19. That's because a number of subjects fell into more than one category. We're looking for the needle in the haystack here. Does, is there a subject that has CSVT and SDH that somebody could think was abused. So we got one left. We got a four month old buckled in a car seat that stopped, the car stopped suddenly, it wasn't a car crash, just stopped suddenly. And that's when irritability started, was taken to the emergency room. They did an ab abdominal ultrasound, which was normal. I don't know why they did that, but that's what was done. And then was cleared to go home. The irritability persisted. The child then was not using her left arm and leg and started having abnormal mental status and seizures. The scans on this kid uh, were important because there's a lot of blood all over the brain and there's also a membrane. And uh, the white arrows are pointing to the membrane and just to, to uh, very, very quickly go over membranes for those who don't worry about this like child abuse doctors do. Uh, when you have a subdural, some cases can form uh, a membrane. This is Dr. Feldman's done studies on this, uh, which is a thin piece of tissue and can cause bleeding over time, but it takes time for membranes to form. If you see a membrane on a CT or CAT scan, it generally means that the subdural has been there for a couple of weeks or more. And that is one of the things we can definitively use to date subdurals. This kid had a membrane, meaning that subdural they found on this day of irritability was old. And you can see it on other scans in the MRI uh, indicating that there's a membrane and this is an, actually an older subdural. And again, this kid had a CSVT. Uh, this child was discharged with mild motor deficits so what was the cause of subdural collections? It's a question mark. Was this kid abused? Was there prior trauma? Is this a lingering birth uh, subdural? It's not typical of acute AHT. This is very different than what we see in our acute cases. 
and there were extensive thromboses in this child, straight sinus, bilateral cortical veins. This is the one case that someone could say, well, is this abuse? Maybe, maybe not. We think because of the membrane, it, it's very different from our typical uh, abuse uh, presentations that, that the, the CSVT could be argued caused everything. So uh, in the conclusions of this study are that CSVT does not make your brain explode, um, or at least we couldn't find evidence to support that. Okay, that's our last slide. We want to finish with some questions, and we have our, our, our folks from the Wizard of Oz uh, skipping uh, up to Oz. And I will lastly point out that although I'm using Wizard of Oz and, and there's a lot of uh, reference to Kansas, um, we are actually in Missouri. Kansas City is oddly named um, in that there are two Kansas cities. One is in Kansas and one is in Missouri, and the big one is in Missouri. If you follow sports, that's where the Chiefs and Royals play. Uh, Kansas City, Kansas is a tiny little uh, industrial town on the other side of the river, and that is a bone of contention for the local folk um, uh, to not be called from the wrong side of the state line. Um, but we greatly appreciate your attention and, and interest in these topics, and we'll stop now to see if there's any questions in our time left. Thank you so much. And there already are some questions in the chat. Um, for some of you, I can't tell who you are. So if you choose to, you can turn on your camera and unmute and ask a follow-up question, but I'll just get started. Um, from somebody, I was once told that if you have high D-dimer or FSP, you can rule out factor eight, or I'm sorry. Yeah, is that is this true? Sorry. It's factor 13. Factor the 13, Roman numerals, yes. The Roman numerals are a, are a challenge for many of us. Um, I know, I just did it, factor yeah. 13. So um, that is one of my favorite um, little trivia points for for hematology. It is actually true. So D dimers are specifically the two D prime ends of fibrinogen. It turns into fibrin, and they are connected together by factor thirteen. That is what does it. Um, and so if you have zero factor thirteen, you cannot covalently link your fibrin, um, and so therefore you cannot generate D-dimers. Once it goes through fibrinolysis, what happens is the hyperfibrinolysis chops the, the different ends, the two pieces around those, that, those two ends of the D-prime um, D ends that have connected covalently with factor 13. And so that's how your D-dimer gets high. So yes, a high D-dimer would rule out severe factor 13 deficiency, but it is one of my lovely little trivia points I like to, you know, because I'm a nerd basically, um, but it's true. That's excellent. And then um, from Katie Johnson, you mentioned getting D-dimer and fibrinogen for critically ill children to evaluate for a DIC. How would these levels be different in DIC versus trauma? So uh, the, the theory behind this uh, is that DIC can cause bleeding anywhere. And certainly trauma can be the inciting factor for the DIC. But there's other things that can cause DIC. And so it doesn't rule out trauma as a cause but I think it necessitates the clinician to think about other causes of DIC and make sure that they're not present. And of course, we all remember from our medical school textbooks, the causes of DIC are really long and you have to think about that. Comes into play in the kids that we call head only, where there's only bleeding in the head and there's nothing else, no fractures, no burns, no abdominal trauma. They're the hardest diagnostic cases and no evidence of impact, anything like that. And, and the idea is to make sure that it's not something else causing the DIC. It does not rule out trauma. Thank you. And then from the other thing, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, no, I just wanted to also clarify that, you know, we know that intracranial trauma can cause DIC. So, you know, you can go, you know, it's hard to know if you find it, which direction things are going in. Um, but it is helpful to have that information. Thank you. And then from... Um, Glenn Tamura, are there definitions of insignificant minor and major trauma for frontline clinicians to use? No. <laughs> Next question. Um, so <laughs> in, the, in those data sets that we looked at, um, it was just trauma. And, and if, you know, whenever you're doing retrospective data, you, you have what you have and it's multi-center, right? And so they unfortunately did not use uh, clarifications of, of the, the level of trauma or the amount of trauma, simply if it was associated with trauma. And this is one of the challenges when you're a child abuse doctor doing research on a hematology database. They don't collect all the data points that we necessarily would, but you also have to look back at prior to the UDC database, they didn't even collect whether it was subdural. And so this isn't uh, 
the the holy grail, but it's just moving us closer in that direction. Thank you. Okay, I'll leave time for this last question from Jay Sarthi. Hey, Shannon, great talk. Do you have recommendations on how to document the clinical likelihood or unlikelihood of ble bleeding disorders in these cases? Hi, Jay. Um, yeah, it's nice to, I guess, virtually hear your voice. Um, so I uh, uh, hope you're doing well. Um, so yeah, I think the important thing is um, as you are the hematologist doing the consult is to um, is to focus on the um, the true likelihood of the, the bleeding disorder, certainly. But I do often put in there um, something around if it particularly if if things are um, there is other evidence of, of abuse or if there are are um, I try to put something in there that that does allude to the fact that having a bleeding disorder does not rule out abuse. Um, because I think that is where people tend to make a logical fallacy. Um, we have had patients, um, since we've instituted, um, in our hematology clinic, uh, a process of if we see a patient under six months of age with bruising, certainly with intracranial hemorrhage, um, who does not have a clear screening test that is abnormal. So they don't come in with a known, you know, somebody's gotten a PTT and the factor eight is less than 1%. Um, we will do a skeletal survey and um, uh, with bruising, we'll do a head CT. Um, and so we'll, we do, uh, we do that regularly from our, our hematology clinic. And what we found uh, is that we found a couple of patients who have rib fractures, who have evidence of abuse, who have a bleeding disorder, a mild bleeding disorder. Um, and so I think it's important to clearly document that we are looking for a bleeding disorder, um, but not looking for necessarily saying that that is the cause of everything else and not, um, and not specifically, you know, we're not ruling out abuse with our process. We are ruling in or out a bleeding disorder. Thank you. I see more, um, oh, I'm sorry. I see more information or questions coming in the chat, but it is 9.02 a.m. So I need to end this session for Grand Rounds. I know that our child abuse folks have another meeting with the two of you. So I will let you, um, I'll let us adjourn and let you, those people go on to that meeting, but I'll just say thank you so much for spending your morning with us. Dr. Carpenter and Dr. Anders, we really appreciate having you here virtually. And to all of our participants, we really appreciate your participation and your questions, and we will see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>